Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, Muriel and Robert, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation d'être ici. Je suis enchanté. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do today is to describe some work that's been carried out in my group in Manchester and more recently at the MRC lab of molecular biology in Cambridge. So what we've been interested in is the prebiotic chemistry associated not just with RNA but with a lot of other molecules as well. So the title I've put for the organizers to put in the booklet is actually the title of a sub-talk within this main talk. What I'd like to do really to start off is to describe the status quo of prebiotic chemistry, which is that there are people who point to the benefits of RNA, its ability to sustain genetics and carry out catalysis. There are also a large camp, there's also a large camp comprising people who point to the advantages associated with metabolism. It provides energy sources and building blocks. Again, people who highlight the advantages of proteins, their superior ability to affect catalysis, and again, their ability to uh, adopt a large variety of structures. And finally, there are people who point out the advantages of lipids for the compartmentalization and the enablement of division, which makes genetics really work. And so what I'd like to really say is that the, the sort of these lines, which have almost constituted battle lines over the years, should really be removed. And what we should really be doing is thinking about the the whole system. So the people who talk about iron nickel sulfide, see John Peters poster for example, there are some very powerful arguments for the involvement of iron nickel sulfide in early prebiotic chemistry. But likewise, there are some very good points from those people who advocate an RNA world, and again, good points from the people who advocate proteins and those who advocate lipids. But let's not actually sort of assume that one or other came first, let's see if we can actually get the benefits from all of them uh, in one go. So we need to think about the chemistry that's going to do this, and the large amount of organic chemistry is predicated on the basis of the early, largely German chemists who were analytically somewhat limited, and so tended to do reactions of the form A plus B going to C. This was because they could simply mix two things, try and get a high yield of a single product, which they could then purify and analyze. But it's rather focused the minds of organic chemists over the years on this sort of chemistry. Whereas, in fact, there's alternative chemistry where you start off with more complex mixtures and you make many, many products. But if I just look at the disadvantages of A plus B going to C for prebiotic chemistry, whilst it's a well-defined reaction manifold and gives a high yield of a single product, it's really an implausibly simple starting mixture. And again, if we look at the Miller-Urey type chemistry, iconic experiments undoubtedly, but and maybe arguably plausible starting mixtures, but numerous ill-defined reaction products, low yields of a huge number of products, and low yields really to an organic chemist is worrisome, because if you then want to invoke any subsequent bimolecular reactions, you have dilute times dilute equals implausible. So what we really want is some chemistry somewhere in the middle. We want to get chemistry that sends us off in the direction of evolution, and we want to avoid always the alternative, which is going off in the direction of a labyrinth of complexity. So we want a sweet spot, which we and others, Gunther von Kudrowski coined the phrase, but in, in this particular part of France, we should point out that the phrase systems chemistry was really first adopted by the group of Kameras et al. when they described a series of papers, système des strecke apparent. So systems chemistry, reasonable starting mixtures, giving reasonable mixtures of products. Is there any synergism in the chemistry associated with this? What about the conditions required to affect the chemistry? Well, we've actually heard from the geochemists that they've given us an embarras du choix. There are too many possible suggestions from the geochemists for us to locate one particular set of conditions and fix on it and say that's what we need to do the chemistry. We've heard about submarine vents, drying lagoons, atmospheric aerosols, a huge number of possibilities. Furthermore, there's been a tendency, I think, in the literature to assume the requirement for static conditions, just constant pH, temperature, whatever. But in fact, of course, there's no reason why we shouldn't have a, a sequence of different conditions, hot, cold, dry, wet, and so on. And this has been alluded to by a couple of speakers, but I think this is very important. We should actually consider sequences of conditions. So what I'd like to do to uh, sort of you know, try and get you to, to see how this new approach might work is to consider systems chemistry. We're going to evaluate amenable subsystems. So we're going to break the overall picture into bite-sized pieces and then analyze these exhaustively under different conditions, compare the conditions of starting materials and products for each little subsystem, then put the information from these subsystems 
multiply to try and infer geochemical conditions. So if we find that the sequence of conditions that makes nucleotides also happens to make lipids, also happens to make peptides, then it will give us some more strong feeling, a triangulation if you like, that those set of conditions might have pertained at the origin of life. We'll assess the chemical consequences that are implied by these systems and then try and piece the systems together to constitute the full system. So let me start off where we came into this. We came into this as synthetic organic chemists uh, with the thought that if we can take an atmosphere containing these elements in some sort of gaseous composition at some sort of oxidation level and we can take them apart into atoms and molecular fragments, allow these to recombine by uh, not by many body collisions but by a small number of uh, body collisions, then the atoms basically have to satisfy their valences by the formation of multiple bonds. So these sort of high energy molecules retain some of the energy of their genesis in the form of these multiple bonds, which means they're high energy species, cyanide, cyanoacetylene, cyanogen, cyanamide, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, etc. These then have the uh, energetic potential at least to have the multiple bonds react to give single bonds and we would hope that at the behest of heat, light, phosphate buffer and so on that we could encourage these to become RNA peptides, preferably genetically coded peptides, amphiphiles and metabolites. So al although the sort of work I do in with the RNA world, we are actually far more interested in making all of these things, but we just start off with the RNA subsystem because it's attractive. Why is it attractive? It's attractive because RNA is the uh, informational molecule which we think of as being important at the origin of life at some stage or another. It's a polymer of sugars linked by phosphates with nuclear bases attached at the anomeric position of the sugars, the four canonical nuclear bases shown here. Now, prebiotic chemists are really no different to conventional synthetic chemists when they think about how to synthesize a molecule. We, we all use this concept of retrosynthesis, and we draw these double-headed arrows to indicate the thought process whereby we disconnect a polymer into monomeric units. The only difference between prebiotic chemists and synthetic chemists is that whilst synthetic chemists try and disconnect molecules to small molecules that are found in the Aldrich catalogue, prebiotic chemists have to disconnect them to things which are putatively, prebiotically plausible. And so the most realistic uh, initial disconnection of RNA, which was investigated over the last 50 odd years, is to disconnect RNA to the, the nucleotide, to then disconnect a single bond and say the nucleoside most likely derives from a nucleoside and phosphate with various degrees of activation. And then the crucial disconnection, that the nucleoside being a nucleobase and a sugar should be disconnected accordingly one can then recognize that ribose is constitutionally the pentama of formaldehyde and the nuclear bases can be constitutionally at least derived from these nitrogenous uh, materials. Now this disconnection has been worked on and in particular the attachment of the nuclear base to the sugar has just proved to be unachievable in the case of the pyrimidines and so, uh, so messy in the case of the purines and so low yielding as to not be convincing. But there are additionally problems with the synthesis of the sugars and the stability of the sugars and so on. So the, the, at this time in 1987, the four of the giants of the field concluded accordingly it's possible that some means of synthesizing the beta ribozides or some method of separating them from their isomers will be discovered, but there is no basis in organic chemistry for optimism which I think was a pretty fair conclusion based upon what was observed at the time, these great difficulties in synthesizing these materials. And this has led people to consider the possibility that RNA being so difficult to synthesize prebiotically might have been a biotic invention of an alternative biology. So some easier prebiotic chemistry makes XNA, X being, XNA being an alternative informational molecule or even informational mineral in some people's opinions. XNA develops a biology and then for some reason it makes a great invention and creates RNA and RNA is a genetic takeover that's how we get RNA. And there's been some enormously creative chemistry and some very sort of you know, interesting synthetic and structural functional chemistry studies of a large range of alternate uh, nucleic acid informational molecules. But our approach is really to say that, look, you know, just because you can't make RNA nucleotides by taking a base and a sugar doesn't mean that you can't make them other ways. So what we did, Matthew Powner, who's already given you a preliminary description of his work, Patricia Land. Myself, we wrote a paper where we described the work we'd carried out by taking half a sugar and half a nuclear base to make a hybrid which is 
half sugar, half nuclear base, uh, a heterocycle which the chemists will call 2-aminooxazole, a reaction which interestingly only proceeds efficiently, and efficiently means 80% yield, not very low yields, 80% yield, a very high yield in the presence of inorganic phosphate. If this reaction is run at a stoichiometry where cyanamide exceeds glycolaldehyde in its concentration, a subsequent phosphate catalyzed reaction also ensues, which is the phosphate mediated hydration of cyanamide to give urea. If we then take this little hybrid of half a sugar and half a nuclear base and add to it another half sugar, when I say half, it's an organic chemist's half, it's three fifths. So glyceraldehyde plus 2 we produce a range of amino oxazolines. And I'll, I'll show you the range in a minute, but the one that we're actually most interested in is this arabino-configured material. And if that material is allowed to react with cyanoacetylene in a reaction which is pH and chemically buffered by inorganic phosphate, then this anhydronucleoside is actually produced in 92% yield in an extremely robust reaction. If we then take phosphate, we want to incorporate the phosphate. The idea was if phosphate's going to end up in the molecule, why not have it present in the system to start off with? And as you can see, it's catalyzed and controlled all these various reactions. It then, in its incorporation, which happens to be catalyzed by the byproduct of the first reaction, urea, in its incorporation, it actually, amazingly to me, actually phosphorylates the secondary alcohol, and after phosphorylating this, intramolecular SN2 displacement gives this cytidine 2,3-cyclic phosphate, which upon irradiation gives rise to a mixture of cytidine and uridine 2,3-cyclic phosphate. So we can make the pyrimidine uh, activated nucleotides by a way which didn't involve making the free sugar or the free base, which just demonstrates that there are other ways of making molecules than that which most obviously strikes you when you first look at it. Uh, particular isomers are shown here, ribo 44%, arabino 30%, Turns out, and, and this was not to be unexpected on the basis of the work of Jerry Joyce and Springsteen, but also on earlier observations of Orgel, that the riboconfigured material is the least soluble of these. One of these isomers crystallizes out, and it's the riboisomer. Now, that to us was so disappointing at first because we want the arabino isomer, but the riboisomer crystallizes. Furthermore, when it crystallizes, it has this interesting property that if you make it with an enantio enrichment of 60% or above, when it crystallizes, it's, it forms crystals as a conglomerate, and it actually crystallizes to give material which is enantiomerically pure. Now, Donna Blackman has actually found a really neat way of actually getting this reaction to make the amino oxazolines to give them insufficient enrichment, they spontaneously crystallize, or at least the ribo compound spontaneously crystallizes in an antimerically pure form. And, and you'll see that when, it, when it's actually, when the publication appears, but it's a beautiful piece of work. I urge you to, to look at it to see how uh, chirality might be transferred from one class of small molecules into another. Anyway, so what we've got is the ribo compound in antimerically pure. So we wondered, could we actually then somehow play a trick uh, and actually get the ribo compound to become the arabino compound? We know that the subsequent reaction is going to involve the uh, chemistry of phosphate. And this reaction was very fast. So we had had no reason to leave this material in the presence of inorganic phosphate for any period of time. But there was a mechanistic reason for thinking that we should do that, because one could envisage these dashed arrows indicate hypothetical chemistry at the time, one could envisage a mechanism which would interconvert the ribo and arabino isomers, and that chemistry would be catalyzed by phosphate. So we simply took the ribo compound, left it in the presence of phosphate for a decent period of time, about a week, and indeed we find these arrows become solid arrows. This equilibration really does take place. So we can now make the, Arab, the ribo compound an antimerically pure and have it equilibrate subsequently with an antimerically pure arabino material this can give us then enantiomerically pure pyrimidine ribonucleotides. I should just focus on a couple of the aspects of the chemistry. First, the phosphorylation. The phosphorylation chemistry is catalyzed by urea, which acts as an oxygen nucleophile to displace water from a rare tautomer of the phosphate monoanion to give an imidoyl phosphate, which can react with another oxygen nucleophile in a reversible fashion via dissociative transition states. And under the conditions which were dry state heating, the water which is evolved uh, is volatile. And so the reaction is driven in favor of uh, alcohol phosphorylation. But it's not really completely reversible under the conditions. So there's an element of thermodynamic control, but we think a big element of kinetic control. The kinetic control is interesting because 
If we take this Arabino isomer, it gives us nigh on 50% of the compound we want, a small amount of material which has had this bond broken by ammonia, which is produced from uh, the formamide that we carry out this reaction in, and a small amount of material where the 2' prime oxygen is up, which means this bond has been broken again uh, by something equating to water. And it turns out that the reason that that bond, uh, the hydrolysis, doesn't proceed to a great extent, and, and the reason that the alcohol that's phosphorylated is the 3 prime, not the 5 prime, is down to this really cute and a priori, at least by us, unpredictable interaction. So one might expect, as an organic chemist, a, a primary hydroxyl to be 10 times more nucleophilic than a secondary. But in this molecule, there is a, a large element of kinetic control in the phosphorylation of the secondary, and that's because the sugar has a conformation which allows this hydroxyl group to approach this carbon to the extent that they get close enough that they are actually closer than the sum of their van der Waals radii. They're kissing each other. They can't actually fully interact because the sugar conformation doesn't let them, but they kiss, and that means that the nucleophilicity of this alcohol is reduced because it's partially satiated by interaction with this carbon, and likewise the electrophilicity of this carbon is partially satiated by the kiss from the oxygen. So these two guys approach each other and mutually protect each other allowing the phosphorylation chemistry to take place on the 3' hydroxyl. So we, we found a way of making these. We, we obviously have to uh, find a way of making the purines as well. We're well into that. Uh, for the last five years, I've been saying we're getting very close. So I won't try and uh, disillusion you by, by telling you we've, we've not been able to make it, but I won't try and over-encourage you by saying we have made it. We're getting close. But we also have to find a way of uh, stringing these things together to make RNA. And it turns out if you take these 2,3-cyclic phosphates in water, they slowly hydrolyze to give a mixture of the monophates, monophosphates. But if you take them in the dry state, you can get them to dimerize, trimerize, etc. But the equilibrium constant is not really very favorable. And there is this huge problem that you end up with the linkages that you want, the 3' prime, 5' prime linkages, but also the linkages that you don't want. And this is a real problem that's, that's sort of you know, been sitting there in the literature of prebiotic chemistry. If you want to make longish RNA molecules where shape depends upon having the correct 3 prime, 5 prime linkage and function depends upon shape, then it's actually crucial that you overcome any problems associated with synthesizing these materials such that you can make them with exclusive control to give 3 prime, 5 prime linked uh, RNA and not have 2 prime, 5 prime linkages. So, Leslie Orgel, as I said, a giant of the field, he showed, for example, if you heat, uh, sorry, you don't actually even have to heat it, you just dry down adenosine 2,3-cyclic phosphate in the presence of an amine at its pKa uh, in vacuo, and you get a range of mon monomer, hydrolysis products, dimer, trimer, etc. If I just focus on the dimer, green is good these days, right, and, and red is bad, so green represents a 3 prime, 5 prime link or a phosphate on the 3 prime position. You get all the compounds you expect. There's a slight selection for uh, 3 prime, 5 prime link materials over 2 prime, 5 prime link materials, but not really good enough to actually get you what you want vis-a-vis -vis the complete control for RNA synthesis. You might say, well, hey, can't we use a template to bring a short oligo in contact with another short oligo and get template-controlled ligation of a 2,3-cyclic phosphate with a 5' hydroxyl? And that would overcome the equilibri equilibrium limitation for entropic reasons of chelation. But sadly, it does control the linkage isomer, but it gives you exclusively the wrong one, as was first observed by Usher and McHale and subsequently exhaustively analyzed in a beautiful paper by Eschen, Moser and colleagues. So we're at an impasse, and I should just point out to you how conventional synthetics solve the problem, synthetic chemists solve the problem. So this is not prebiotic chemistry, this is Gobind Karana in his groundbreaking work on the chemical synthesis of, of nucleotides. He said, look, the way to do it is to put a protecting group on the two prime position, have a three prime phosphate, use a carbodiimide activator, then we can have this hydroxyl of one molecule attack this phosphate of another, and we can get oligomerization with, with complete control of the linkage isomer will then hydrolyze off the uh, acetate or take it off with ammonia. In fact, the monomer cyclizes and it turns out the dimer and the trimer cyclize. So to overcome that problem, he puts in 20 mole percent of something which is 2 prime, 5 prime diacetate because 
if the chain elongates from a 2,5 diacetate, when it reaches the dimer or the trimer stage, it can't cyclize. And so this gives rise to a higher yield of linear acetyl oligomers, which can be then converted by brief treatment with aqueous ammonia to RNA uh, oligomers. But how on earth are we going to get protecting group chemistry to go in prebiotic chemistry conditions? So let me then go back to our overall approach. Let's compare the, the conditions, starting materials and products for each subsystem. So how do I get my phosphate? PASEC and Key showed that I can take Schreibersite iron nickel phosphide inclusions in iron meteorites and oxically corrode it to give phosphate. But the phosphate they produced was insoluble. And Terry Key, at least, to, to solubilize the phosphate, added sulfide and got sodium hydrogen phosphate, soluble phosphate. But of course, at the same time, he also got iron nickel sulfide. One man's meat is another man's poison. This, of course, is a great way of making iron nickel sulfide. Let's now use the information from the subsystems to infer geochemical scenarios. This is very preliminary, so please don't uh, worry too much about what we're suggesting. What we're thinking is that we can get the energy and the iron nickel phosphide inclusions that we need to get the phosphate from a meteorite impact on the Earth, iron nickel meteorite impact. Something smaller than that which caused the Earth-Moon uh, division. Something bigger than this. This is a meteorite taking out... I, I looked at this, I think this looks like whales but I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so a, a medium-sized iron nickel meteorite will give me the energy I need to remodel the atmosphere. The uh, radiation towards the surface of the ejector will volatilize part of the ocean to give me water vapor that I need. But we should start assessing the chemical consequences of this. If you have iron, hot iron in a carbon dioxide atmosphere, you can reduce to make CO. CO is useful to a chemist. CO is, a, is dead. So we want carbon monoxide, let's let this cool down because we're going to get a sequence of events after a meteorite impact, not a static set of conditions, a sequence of events. At a lower temperature we can have carbon monoxide and water giving a variant, the kerbel engelhardt variant of the Fischer-Tropsch reaction, to give a range of alkanes and alkanols. So let's just think about what we can do with the alkanols. Let's see that we can use these and see if that uh, gives us any more information. So here's a representative uh, experiment. We take the sort of alkanols you might get from a fischer tropsch or colbell engelhardt experiment. We dope it with an excess of the small alcohols to prove the point, which is that if we subject it to exactly the same phosphorylation conditions that work in the nucleotide chemistry, we phosphorylate selectively the medium chain alkanols. The short ones, because the chemistry is reversible, boil out of the system. So we end up with the, the right sort of length to start making uh, vesicles or, or bilayers. So the, the synergy in the chemistry. We should now start assessing the chemical consequences, the implied scenarios. Iron nickel sulfide, we all know that Vactrosoys and Russell have, have banged the drum about this, but, but I think they have a very good point. It makes some interesting molecules, but don't overdo it. So what does it do? Beautiful paper by this French group have summarized what iron nickel sulfide will do if given carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide, you can make thioformic acid, thioacetic acid. And so what we should be doing if we're embracing the whole field is to put thioacetate into our nucleotide chemistry. So let's take the hydrolysis product of a 2,3-cyclic phosphate and thioacetate and add a nuclear base component. And lo and behold, what you do is you protect the 2 prime hydroxyl of the nucleotide. How does it work? Thioacetate attacks cyanoacetylene to give it an s cyanovinyl acetyl group which acetylates the most nucleophilic group now in the system, which is the phosphate dianine. The intermediate phosphocarboxyanhydride delivers an acetyl group, the 2 prime hydroxyl, and this then takes place to give the uh, dicyanovinyl sulfide uh, product. It's really sweet chemistry in the sense that if you take a mixture of the 3-phosphate and the 2-phosphate, the chemistry works really well on the 3-phosphate, but doesn't work so well on the 2-phosphate. So we can actually take a 4-to-1 mixture of these two materials, bump up the number of equivalents of the acetylation reagents, and now we get a 72% chemical yield in water at pH 7 of the 2-prime acetate. We also get a bit of the 2-prime, 5-prime diacetate, not 20 mole percent, but close to it. And the 2-prime uh, phosphate reacts to a very small extent. It's RNA partially acetylated throughout its length. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this molecule because one can make a couple of predictions about its structure. Firstly, a minor interactions, which are responsible for a large amount of the tertiary structure adopted by RNA, will be substantially reduced by acetylating the 2' hydroxyl. Secondly, structural diversity in RNA is very often associated with north-south equilibria in the sugar. 
So terns in RNA are often associated with S-form sugar puckers. If we can enforce the north-form sugar pucker throughout the structure of RNA, we should endow upon it a much greater helical propensity. The acetate group will undoubtedly confer north-form properties upon the molecule. So we predict that this is going to have very strong tendency to form duplex structure. It should be the ideal material to copy genetically. But then, of course, the acetates are chemically labile, so if you affect genetics with acetyl RNA, you can subsequently cleave the acetates off and get functional folded RNA afterwards. So the chemistry of making RNA might give us something reminiscent of DNA in extant biology, but something which is actually a chemical precursor of RNA. So getting back to this question of the, 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 within the, the talk, Perhaps the chemistry to make RNA isn't going to be as difficult as people have first thought. Maybe, in fact, the chemistry to make these other materials might be more difficult. And given that it might be more difficult, and there is big why and how questions as to why XNA should invent RNA, maybe we should start thinking again of RNA as a prebiotic product. So just to stress to you again that there is some benefit, I think, to be derived by taking the best ideas of the people in the various camps and trying to add them together. So the, the field, I think, requires to be unified. And I'll, I'll end on that point, just to, a couple of acknowledgements to make which are very important. First of all, uh, a large part of this work was carried out by Matthew Pounder, as you've seen before, and, and great credit to him for doing this, a great piece of work, but also Beatrice Jalonde, Michael Crow. Uh, Jesus and uh, Van Sian, and in particular Saidul, have made great contributions to this work. My, my eternal thanks to them for being such good co-workers and great friends. Crystallographic assistants, Albert Eschenmoser inspired this entire approach to prebiotic chemistry when I was a PhD student and saw him lecture, a, a man many years ahead of his time. And these funding agencies have very generously supported us. Thank you to them and to you for your attention.